Uh, I'm Andre Kulenschmidt, and this is work that I've done with Dale and Almori and uh, Jeremy Seek uh, at Indiana University. Um, today I'm going to tell you about a uh, efficient compiler for the gradually typed lambda calculus. And indeed, uh, uh, for anyone who would like hasn't seen the other six talks or so about gradual typing, gradual typing allows you to uh, move gradually between uh, statically typed programs and dynamically typed programs uh, within the same programming language. Um, so sound gradually typing means that you can uh, believe the type annotations in the program, essentially. Uh, the prog both the programmer and the compiler have a good guarantee that the values flowing into the type to things annotated with that type are actually of that type. Uh, but this has been shown to have rather uh, serious performance implications. And we, our line of research has been investigating if you build a gr language from the ground up to have, uh, with gradual typing in mind, essentially, what performance can you get uh, out of that? And this is sort of a part of, partial answer to it. Um, so we implemented Grift. Grift is an ahead of time compiler for the gradually typed lambda calculus um, to space efficient C code for, um, yeah, to space efficient C code. Here when I say space efficient C code, I mean uh, that the compiler maintains the asymptotic space complexity of programs if they weren't gradually typed. Um, so the gradually typed lambda calculus is a uh, functional uh, structurally typed language where the granularity of adding types is uh, fine grained, uh, if it were. So you can add a single type constructor, such as in this case we've added um, the fact that f is just a, a function without saying anything about its argument or uh, the return value. Um, it also enjoys the gradual guarantee. So as you add types to the program, uh, as long as it's correct type information, the, uh, the behavior of the program won't change. Uh, so I'm going to apologize. I'm about to flash a bunch of code up on the screen. And uh, that code is going to be. Uh, uh, you don't need to understand it, but it's just to give you a flavor of sort of, when I say the gradually typed lambda calculus, I'm probably talking about something that's closer to scheme. But um, so we've extended the language with uh, integers, floating point numbers, booleans, vectors, um, uh, defines, mute, let rex, uh, uh, and area tuples, sort of the things that you would want in a realistic programming language, but it's not a full programming language still. Um, and the main point here is that if you, um, our experience has been that if you uh, choose uh, carefully your runtime data structures, you can actually get pretty good performance. And that's, uh, to some extent, that's all we've done so far. And you'll get to judge your, for yourself whether or not that's your definition of pretty good performance. Um, so the Griff compiler um, as a whole just type checks your program. Um, so gradually typed programs have implicit casts in them where uh, the dynamic type and static types interact. Um, so the, it makes these casts explicit. Um, it lowers casts into these runtime data structures that I'm talking about. Uh, and it performs some minor optimizations uh, that are very local in the sense that it eliminates dispatch on data structures that are known at compile time. And it uh, uh, eliminates allocating data structures when you know via the reduction rules, essentially, that those data structures are just going to be eliminated and then never referenced again. Um, but other than that, it just performs closure conversion and emits C code. Um, so this puts you somewhere in the ballpark of dynamic programming languages. Here we have uh, a comparison on six benchmarks to uh, Racket, Gambit, and Shea scheme. Uh, speed up uh, the y and the y axis is speed up with respect to a racket. So below one means that we're performing less well than racket, and above one indicates that other benchmarks are performing better than racket. Um, here we are performing in general roughly about two times slower than racket, um, but we occasionally beat uh, gambit. Uh, so we're like somewhere close, uh, there's still like a lot of low hanging fruit to sort of work on. Um, there's also a lot of large differences between the implementations, such as we're using the bone collector and not a custom GC or anything like that. Um, 
So likewise, we're also in the ballpark of statically typed programming languages. Uh, here we're, we roughly have the same performance as OCaml uh, when given completely static input, uh, and we do quite a bit better than typed racket um, on that input. Uh, and sort of the only uh, optimizations that we get from the statically typed code are what the C compiler are giving us. Uh, so. Um, uh, so throughout the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about partially typed programs. When I say a partially typed program, I mean if we started with a completely statically typed uh, program and we sort of erase type annotations, um, there's many ways essentially that you could erase type annotations using the dynamic type. Um, and you can sort of the ratio of erased annotations to, um, to how many there were in total form like a percentage and that's how we report um, sort of where we are in the typing lattice. Um, so here's a uh, sort of picture of how we would ideally want performance to look. Um, so here uh, you sort of see that stat or dynamically typed programs run kind of slow, um, and then as you uh, add type information, it just slowly gets faster in like a linear sort of model. Uh, but uh, typical uh, performance looks more like this. Yeah. In fact, this is what happens on Black Scholes. Oh, yes, yeah, so, sorry. This is, this is indeed the performance on Black Scholes. It's just not all benchmarks look this way, is all I mean by this. Um, and it, indeed, the, the performance is dominated by first order checks in this program, and that's the reason why it increases linearly. As you essentially erase more uh, floating point operations, they get faster, and yeah. Uh, whereas the, the sort of higher order casts don't form boundaries that are meaningful uh, in a performance aspect. Um, so on this, uh, on FFT, on the other hand, uh, you, you notice that uh, you start out somewhat slow and you get uh, up to 2x slower, it looks like, and then as you continue to add more type information, you uh, eventually do get back down to sort of uh, the static type performance. Um, and here, uh, 2x overhead is actually uh, I'd like to comment that this is, uh, while sort of egregious in some ways, uh, it's also still quite low in comparison to uh, many of the numbers that have been reported in uh, the literature for overhead of higher order contracts uh, in gradual typing. Um, so we're actually quite happy with this, even though it looks uh, somewhat uh, messy. Um, so the key point, uh, so that's basically the performance. Uh, I'm now gonna go through and describe sort of how coercions affect performance and how monotonic references perfect, uh, affect performance, which are the two secret, not secret, because we completely borrowed them from the literature, um, but <laughs> um, data structures that we're using in this work. Um, so space-efficient coercions prevent uh, possible asymptotic complexity changes to the runtime of programs. Um, they have uh, a low constant time overhead, and, uh, but they do incur like the, the, the sort of straightforward implementation of them, which would be to use proxying for higher order contracts, does um, incur overhead still in statically typed programs, which we have been able to measure. Um, so to sort of illustrate uh, where this overhead's coming from, uh, I'm going to use this example, which is uh, sort of uh, contrived in some ways, but it, it actually very well, uh, it very uh, succinctly represents sort of uh, the sorts of problems that you face with in large, much larger programs uh, where it's less obvious that this is what is occurring. Um, so here, uh, this is quick sort. Uh, it's kind of a naive implementation in some ways, but it's quick sort. You recursively sort your, sorry, partitioning an array uh, here called V. Uh, into two parts, um, and then you sort the parts as per usual. Um, the sort of uh, hidden thing here is that uh, the, the programmer has nefariously or somewhat randomly um, uh, labeled the binding site of this sort uh, as requiring a vector of integers, but the actual lambda itself is requiring a vector of dynamic types. And so sound gradual typing requires the this is actually the types that you get. Um, so uh, to sort of see through the implicit casts and make them explicit, uh, this is the program after cast insertion. 
Um, so the first cast that occurs uh, will be the cast on the lambda. And this cast, whenever you apply sort, is going to cast a vector of integers that it receives to a vector of dynamic values. Um, likewise, there are two other casts on the recursive calls. Um, and these casts uh, cast dynamic vectors to vectors of integers. So you kind of have this contra, uh, or you have this like uh, sort of casting back and forth action that happens at each call site. Um, so if we, if we kind of think of the execution of this, uh, you have some variable v, you do partition, you uh, perform a cast, you apply sort, which then does cast. Uh, a programmer could like type this into a REPL and sort of um, imitate what's going on here. And that's indeed sort of what this is supposed to look like. And then uh, I'm gonna make some further simplifications to sort of compact the code and to make it easier to model here on the other side. Um, I'm gonna say that the vector is actually just a box and that the uh, partition calls are just reads and writes on that box. Um, uh, so here we have uh, box B um, and we initialize the box B with uh, 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 the number two for some odd reason. Uh, and then we uh, have that cast that was inserted by the compiler, and we uh, and that cast cast the dynamic box to an integer box. Um, oh, here, sorry, there's our box B. Here's what, uh, and this is sort of the naive approach, uh, just putting that out there. So type based, you can read naive proxies. Um, so we've got this dynamic box, we cast it to an integer, and you have to sort of put some sort of information there that allows you to know that in the future, whenever you extract values from that box, you're going to need to cast them. And whenever you stick values back into the box, you need to cast them to the type of the box. And so you record the sort of runtime type information here on a proxy. Um, if we cast it again, uh, due to the way that blame works in these languages, you actually, you want to be able to know that that number two is going to be blamed if you ever read a, uh, if you ever read a value that's not an integer out of the box. And whenever you write a value that's not an integer, you need to be able to blame that number one. And so if you, you would think that you could just somehow collapse these proxies, and indeed that's what quotients do, but, um, but sort of in the naive approach that doesn't happen, and so you need data structures to sort of manage this. Um, so I'm going to, so I guess one thing to note that whenever you do this unbox here, so whenever you do the first write, you get a constant time write on the box. Whenever you do the unbox, you get a constant time write, but you don't have to go through two levels of indirection here. But, um, and I'll come back to that, sorry. Okay, um, so here we're gonna talk about coercions. We're gonna sweep a lot of the details under the rug, but the, the core idea that you wanna take away is that the coercions give you a way of composing proxies. So here, after casting, uh, B1, we're gonna have a proxy with two coercions in it. I'm just like opaquely calling them C1 and C2. Um, whenever we cast, um, do the cast that's labeled one, that ends up being a value B2. B2 is going to be two new coercions. Those coercions are the result of composing the cast that needed to occur to create the value for B1 with the values that were already in, or with the sort of type information that was already in C1 and C2 and coercions are just a technology that allow you to do this. In particular, they allow you to do this in a bounded amount of space. And so this, this really is always going to be um, sort of a constant amount of space that you have to, or a constant amount of work that you have to do in order to get to the box that you, that you want to get a value out of. So this unbox here would occur in a constant amount of space too. Okay, so if we take these uh, sort of two constant operations, and we consider the fact that we're in a recursive loop. So going way back to the sort there, we were in a, we were in a recursive loop that was casting. So the first, layer, the first uh, iteration of the loop caused two proxies to build up. The second iteration of the loop is going to cause four proxies to build up. So whenever we uh, go to do dereferences on those proxies, or partitions in this case, awesome, um, the first one's going to have to sort of iterate through one uh, or it's through none uh, to get to it. 
The second one's gonna have to do, go through two each time it wants to access the box. And the third one is going to have to go through four, while coercions always have like a constant access time. Um, so this actually gets reflected as uh, runtime. So here's the quick start benchmark. Um, type based casts are shown as the circle dots. You can't see the coercions because they're all down there at the bottom because this is n cubed, whereas coercions are n squared. Um, so for like a more um, sort of typical uh, amount of improvement that you would see, this has a space leak, but it doesn't change the asymptotic complexity that we know of. Um, but you do end up getting some accumulation of proxies and these uh, and coercions do uh, reduce the overhead that you see there. Uh, so, and type base casts to the circles once again. So type base and coercions are gonna remain circles and triangles respectively as they are. Um, occasionally you do see that coercions um, have some overhead. It always tends to be rather low in, uh, it's, so it's not changing the asymptotic complexity. It's just not paying for itself in a particular benchmark essentially. Um, so, but proxying does cause a measurable difference So, if you, uh, in static code. So if you look at the proxy bar here, um, it's not up to the uh, static grift like normalization line and that's because uh, there is a branch in our code. And that branch, even though it's not taken in the static code, uh, does exist and does cause overhead. So here we've got a P box, a proxy box, because we're about to introduce a new type of box. Um, the box that flows to it could either be a proxy dynamic box or it could be a integer box and therefore we have to compile this code to this, um, which has a branch in it even though you're always taking the else branch. Monotonic allows us to get rid of this overhead. Um, it allows us to get rid of this overhead by compiling statically typed uh, M boxes of ints to just the direct C code operation that you would expect it to or that you would want it to. Um, it does this via essentially creating this invariant that the value in the heap is always going to be as statically typed as any an annotation it's passed through. Um, so this you might have a dynamically typed monotonic box that has some dynamic type information in it. Once it passes through an integer um, type annotation, we're actually going to update the shape of the heap so that it like behaves uh, so that it's just like an integer box that you can do a read out of. Um, oh, whoops. And this means that uh, this means that uh, the integer box like can be compiled to the sort of the high efficiency version and the dynamic uh, unbox uh, has to like do a little bit of extra work. Um, this is measurable uh, uh, in the fact that monotonic grift like is, is, has less overhead than proxied grift in static programs. Uh, it tends to be fast. Excuse me, I'm sorry, can you point out what's like, uh, sure. that was a little fast. Sorry, uh, the geometric mean here, um, it shows that in general monotonic grift is very close to the static grift side. In fact, I don't know why it's not the static grift side in some sense, but. Uh, uh, and uh, proxied on the other hand has about a 20% overhead uh, because of the, some of the benchmarks are tight loops uh, that are accessing arrays through proxies. Um, Monotonic's like in general faster than proxied uh, unless it doesn't really matter. Uh, in which case, this is Black Scholes again, which is dominated by first order checks, not array checks. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Grift is open source and you can play with it online if you want. Um, do you have any questions? Is with, with respect to blame, is your is your attitude towards blame pretty much the same model that's associated with tight brackets? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, so there's um, maybe some philosophical differences, uh, but 
Uh, in general, yes, there are two sides, to, or there, there are, blame is tracked, and it's tracked in basically the same way. It just should never be the case that the static type system gets blamed, oh, uh, which That's seems to be about the same as. Uh huh. So is the, is the... Sorry. Keep going, though. Yes. So I definitely think it's the case. Um, I think that uh, coercions in general make it easier to see where uh, overhead is being introduced in the program uh, because it basically puts it next. Like, if if your program doesn't have any casts in it, um, then you're not going to have any overhead. It's essentially, the, um, but uh, it localizes because it's constant time. It localizes the the cost to where casts occur. Um, so it, yes. Yeah, you, you could basically see where a higher order cast is going to occur and sort of do profiling maybe and or uh, like examine the execution and see what you think like is going to be a costly one because it gets access a lot. Uh, it's the depth, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, it, okay, so, yes, okay, so he is correct. It's the size of types, not the depth of types, uh. Though depth does increase, so depth has, in some ways, uh, might be more noticeable because there's a, so for coercions, uh, there's a 2x factor each time you go a level down. Um, so, or sorry, for references, there's a 2x factor because you have a read and a write um, coercion, essentially. So you duplicate the amount of work that you have to go for every layer, layer deep. So that's when, when I say it's bounded by the depth of types, that's like the, the biggest factor is growing at exponentially with the depth of your types. That's mean that it was naive approach. No, no, no. So if you nest, okay, if you nest uh, references inside of each other, uh, you're you're growing exponentially in the depth. It's a constant because it's constant with the. Um, it's just reference in versus reference down. What's the okay, so it's bounded by the size of the types in the thing. So it'd be constant one like size, basically. Um, so, yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, so type analysis might be a strong word, but the, rep the, the type of a value does change its representation in memory. Um, when you are in a type world, your first endpoints are not allocated. Yes. So maybe it might be interesting not only to show runtime execution, but also memory allocation. And maybe just these graphs uh, with the size of the allocation might be very Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you very much.